Hey everybody, it's Seth Jones, editor in chief of Landscape Management Magazine, doing another LM at Home Edition Zoom interview. I'd like to welcome Isaac Roberts. He is the co-founder and COO of Scythe, a manufacturer of autonomous mowers. Hi, Isaac. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for taking that time, Seth. This is fantastic. First, tell me what is Scythe? Yeah, absolutely. So we're a robotics company focused on the landscaping industry. Uh, we started in 2017, uh, me and two other co-founders, my co-founders, Jack and Davis. Jack has a software background and Davis has a hardware background. And with the three of us, um, it was uh, attractive to put the company together and focus on the problems that we were looking at. Okay. So describe it to me. What does it, what's it look like? What's it do? What's it specs? Yeah, absolutely. So the company started from uh, some pain point that Jack and I both felt, uh, which was mowing grass and just the the hot summer sun recognizing this is something that was not a lot of fun. Um, we were talking about outdoor autonomy and robotics in general and realized that this is something that's a you know large pain point felt by a lot of different people. And so we focused on uh, building robots for this space so that we can go and tackle um, cutting grass. and. What really we're focused on is we're building a commercial mower for the landscaping industry with a 52 inch deck as it currently stands. Uh, it's all electric. A lot of the things that we had in mind were the idea of, um, it was kind of an interesting paradox where you have the landscaping industry, the one industry that takes care of the outdoors is running a bunch of gas powered equipment that's not so great for the outdoors. Um, so it was kind of important for us to focus on aligning these incentives and the overall objective. And right now is a great time because you see companies like Tesla doing this. Um, so we're we're basically building an electric version of the current commercial mowers, but it is effectively stronger and has the ability to be autonomous as well. I know a little bit about your background, but I guess tell 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 me and the viewers what why are you uh, the right guy? Why why is this uh, the right field for you to be in, and, and how are you going to solve? the robotic mowing uh, riddle? Yeah, good question. Um, there's certainly some debate around it ultimately, but what it comes down to is uh, we're a robotics company focused on landscaping. And there's a, a pretty big difference there from some of the people that we're looking at in the space as it is today. There's a, a lot of people running around trying to solve the problem. Uh, it's a very, very technical um, problem. There's a lot of complexity that goes into it. Effectively, what you're doing is you're building self-driving cars that have blades of death on the bottom. So there's a very high priority for us to make sure that these things are safe, reliable, and incredibly durable, right? So when we first looked at it, we thought about the idea of retrofits. Um, we talked to a bunch of investors and they had similar questions saying, why not just go for a retrofit? You can get something to the market faster. What we found out is that these mowers that exist currently, they are not made to last. There's kind of an incentive across the industry to make these things um, break down over three or four years and then be replaced. We, if you look at it from a robotics perspective, if you're if you're trying to make a robot that will um, be based on a robots as a service business model, what you're really doing is you're in, you're aligning your incentives with the landscaping company to make sure that you're a partner, not a vendor, right? So we see ourselves as a partner for the landscaping industry to be able to scale their workforce like they've never been able to before. And with the idea of uh, going to electric, you know, some people are uh, looking at the longevity of Tesla cars. There's a strong argument argument to be made that these cars are going to last two or maybe three or four times longer than current cars because gas powered systems effectively have um, just a lot of moving parts, right? But building an electric system gives you the ability to eliminate all those parts. You don't have anything to grease. You don't have any belts to replace. Spindle bearings are encased in the electric motor as opposed to exposed to the elements. Uh, the list goes on, right? Um, so I think that there are some pretty strong advantages that we're representing um, compared to what we're seeing in the market today. Now we're moving into our uh, current generation caribou, and that's what you're seeing in all of the uh, information on the website. This, this generation, we are making about eight of them. Um, we have one in Colorado, one in Florida, one in Texas. We're working with partners to test these in the field on a regular basis. Uh, we're acting as subcontractors currently and are putting these into customers' hands today. Um, the feedback has been a very consistent uh, flow for us. The very first time we showed our initial spec, the very first unit, the first prototype that we made, I remember going to some guys that are uh, old dogs in the industry and they literally told me the wheels are on backwards. They said, you know, zero turn mowers have big wheels in the back. And we thought big wheels in the front was the way to go from an engineering perspective. And we've been learning ever since. Uh, so. Now we're at the point where 
we are making something that we're very confident in its durability, its reliability, um, and ultimately the the autonomy is paramount in terms of the capabilities of it, but this is not something where you could look at it and say, this is going to replace a person. Uh, you might be able to take that 20% of the uh, person that is currently mowing 100% and make that 20% be what they do with an autonomous system. But you're never gonna, I don't think at least, you're gonna ever get away from having some human in the loop. Um, and we're finding that out in the field today and have been for the last couple of years now. Who is your ideal customer for this? So when we place these units, um, we're looking to place 11 units uh, at a minimum, right? And so what that means is a, a landscaper that, um, that wants to adopt these systems in the early days, and of course, early is right now, um, the more refined the product gets, the more durable it gets over time, the more this starts to not be a factor. But in the early days, we're looking at we want to make sure that a company can take 11 of these units and use 10 of them. And the reason for that is because the, the industry today, there's a very tight relationship, uh, which I mean, I'm not telling you, you or your audience anything new, but there's a very tight relationship between the landscaper and the, um, the dealership, right? And so these guys, the, the really sharp landscapers all know, make sure that you're really good friends with your dealer because they're the ones that can make or break your business. And that's all predicated on the equipment being the crutch for the company. And we're not looking to uh, build this footprint across the country. We're looking to use effectively the Amazon model where we can centralize these units, deploy them to a specific market, to a particular customer. And that means that we need to have some uh, flexibility on the way that we do that deployment. And our, our thought is that when a customer takes 10 of these units, we send them 11. So an order of 10 means you get 11. One of those units of the first 10 let's say one breaks down on uh, Monday morning and you're like, oh, well, and now I have nine mowers. Our thought is, no, you don't. You unpack the 11th mower and then you put it into service and then we pick up that unit that went down. And by the time this whole process has gone through, we've already got another unit on its way to the to the landscaper. Okay, great. Uh, I was watching a previous interview with you with the, and, I, and I saw you say something that caught my ear that uh, you said that you think that trenched in underground guide wires are going to be a thing of the past in a few years on these. Or, or not, and I don't know. Where yeah, absolutely. So, so what? How is yours knowing where to go? Yeah. So we we have a lot of um, expensive compute and sensors across the platform. So um, full 360 view. So we have on on Caribou there are two cameras on the front, two on the back, two on each side. That allows for us to get depth from these images, right? You you can the same way human eyes work is we're doing depth analysis uh, with our brains we're looking at the computer to be able to do the same thing inside the robot, right? But it needs those uh, stereo pair lenses. The, the guide wires are an artifact of um, precision problems on localization. And of course, you have issues of uh, limited compute. For us, we're looking at it and saying, what if we were to spend $30,000 on a robot instead of $300, what could that unlock for us? Um, so we we spend and I'd say overspend on over engineering the equipment, making sure the sensor suite is packed out, making sure that there's enough compute to handle all of this incredibly uh, complex understanding of geometric space and the, the world around the robot so that it can go and do things on its own as opposed to just literally bunt, like go straight until it sees the guide wire through some kind of electromagnetic signal and then bounce around or do what a Roomba does, which is it goes up against a wall, bounces, and then turns around and goes and does another direction. What we're looking at is we have information from wheel odometry, we have information from cameras, ultrasonics, uh, GPS, RTK GPS, um, the list goes on, including all of the information that you're getting from your cell phone, like an IMU or an accelerometer, gyrometer, et cetera. Okay. So all of that information comes into the robot, and the robot's able to make a, an educated guess, or I should say, a hyper-educated understanding of what the world is and then act as according to how a human would perform. And so our use case is we put these into a trailer just like any other landscaper would, any other regular mower, uh, like commercial mower. And then we get to the job site, these mowers get unloaded. If it's the first time it's ever been to that property, the landscaper hops on it and rides it around just like a regular mower, but mows the perimeter of the area, right? And then based on that information the operator can say i want the stripes to be in this direction or this direction whatever that is uh, and then says go for it get started 
the robot then starts to handle this pattern as would a normal landscaper, and it's able to identify trees, people, dogs, uh, trash, uh, any kind of other obstacle, and then either behave the way that we would want it to do or the way that a landscaper would prefer it to do. And ultimately, it's the same thing. It's just a matter of surfacing that decision making across the entire uh, user experience. So for right now, we're going around trees, we're um, you know, stopping for things like uh, a bucket or a piece of trash, et cetera. And all of that is continuously being developed. OK. What are your goals for production? How soon do you think you, if, if someone's like, wow, I'm in, when can they get them? Yeah, so we, um, we set up a list for people to be able to sign up to get them. And so those folks are certainly a priority for us. Uh, the list continues to grow, um, but ultimately, the uh, the earliest adoption is one in which uh, it's in Florida or Texas in these markets that I just mentioned because that's where we're actually field testing these things and we're very hands on with this relationship right now. Um, hopefully, we'll have this into a scenario where it's very stable and reliable for customers to have it in their hands, um, you know, in a permanent manner sometime around the middle of next year, 2022, um, and then. I think that general availability across the board, um, you know, we might be looking at somewhere around 2023. Okay, great. Well, Isaac, those are my questions. I, I look forward to learning more and, and checking out your website and whatnot, but I appreciate you taking the time and talking to my, uh, to my viewership here at Landscape Management Magazine. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for putting it on. Okay, this is Isaac Roberts. He is the co-founder and COO of Scythe. And uh, I'm Seth Jones. Thanks for checking us in with us here at uh, Landscape Management's At Home Edition. Thanks, everyone.